John D. Rockefeller was the world's first bona fide billionaire, meaning that his billion dollar status wasn't retroactively calculated with inflation. Instead, he was the first person to own a billion's worth of assets in real time. And that's even after the Great Depression wiped 10 billion from his bank accounts. But even that barely cost a dent to his pocketbook. Now, his fortune is spread across six generations and 70 heirs, so it's understandable why he has such a divisive reputation. For some, he was a revolutionary tycoon and trend-setting philanthropist. For others, he's a puppet master who used his wealth and power to skew the law in his favor. In any case, you don't make $360 billion without making a few enemies, or friends in high places. Thankfully, the rules which helped him change the landscape of business and commerce can be followed by anyone, so let's examine them to separate the man from the myth. So it's time to learn how history works, as we explain why the Rockefellers never lost their fortune. Rule 1. Get conned. John D. Rockefeller was born on July 8, 1839 to Eliza Davison, a devout Christian, and William Rockefeller Sr., a devout con artist. John's father was nicknamed Devil Bill, and was a traveling snake oil salesman who would voyage across the Wild West with his bogus cure-alls. He was a known scoundrel who'd run up the tabs at shops before skipping town. Store of $1,000. In the 19th century, that's an enormous sum of money. But then he would come back, most frequently at night, so people would never know where he came from. Often with a new woman on his arm. He was such a bad boy that he wore a pin falsely proclaiming himself to be deaf and dumb. That way, it would be easier to exploit the emotions of any person whose door he knocked. One of those homeowners was Eliza. She was so taken by this charming door-to-door -door salesman that she even remarked she would marry him if he didn't have his afflictions. Needless to say, their marriage was nothing short of a miracle. The young Jonathan grew up in a household divided between strict moral codes and loose business ethics. His father remarked that he enjoyed doing business with his sons just so he could rip them off. The logic was that having a con artist as a mentor prepared them for the pitfalls of capitalism. I do business deals with my sons and I always try to cheat them, to make them sharp. Bill would even lend them money at incredible interest rates just so he could demand repayment in full at deliberately inconvenient timings. This was, he said, to teach them about reserves and savings. And it worked. There are plenty of billionaires who lose their fortunes in a flash because they never had enough cold cash in the vault. In the end, John would distance himself from his father after Bill fled town following a rape accusation from a housemaid. In fact, Bill even took a second wife and refused to show at the funeral of Eliza, after which John told everyone that his mother had been a widow all along. Still, he did not forget what it was like to be on the wrong end of a business deal, and no doubt used this knowledge to his advantage when it came to beating rivals during the oil boom. But he wouldn't have gotten into that position if he didn't have this next rule. Rule 2. Count every penny. John's mother was a woman of thrift and hard work. Whereas his father flaunted wealth from his latest scam and once returned home with a tablecloth of banknotes, it was her who taught their son the importance of bookkeeping. John kept a ledger of his spending, as per her instruction. Even as a young boy, John made a note of every single penny he came across. His seriousness brought mockery from his classmates, but soon, his hard work for accountancy paid off. Literally. The abandonment by his father forced John to give up his dreams of college. He had to drop out of high school to find work to support his mother and his siblings at just 16 years old. He found an assistant bookkeeping job for Hewitt and Turtle, and threw himself into the work. Young John scrutinized every receipt and bill in incredible detail. It didn't take him long to make the shocking discovery that his superior's poor accounting meant that the business was often misplacing pennies. To most, the loss of a couple of dimes means nothing, but John's experience keeping a ledger from a young age had shown him firsthand how inefficiency compounds losses. But his bookkeeping practices didn't stay at the office. He counted every penny he gave to beggars in the street, every dollar he donated to abolitionist causes, and every percent he put into the collection plate at church. When it came to raising his own children, he made sure that accountancy was in their blood. They too had to keep track of everything they spent, especially if they wanted their allowance because all chores had their own price tag. After all, John knew how easy it was to lose money if it wasn't appreciated. That's why it was important for him to give away his fortune even before he had one. Rule 3. Give back early and often. Through his mother's guidance, John became deeply religious. He would sweep the church floor, participate in the choir, and studied the Bible often. One time, a pastor told him that he should earn as much as he can and then give away as much as he can. In his religious community, every $10 you made meant that the first three went back to the church. 
This habit was vital in learning to not take money personally. The fact that his economic philosophy was tied up with philanthropy means his motivation for charity stems from his religion, and not tax evasion, unlike certain people. Loser. As it is written in scripture, with great power comes great responsibility. Yet John knew that making a success of charity required the same innovation as making a success of business. After all, he received almost 50,000 letters a month from strangers asking for financial help, so writing a few checks would have been enough for most people to feel good about themselves. But John D. Rockefeller wasn't like most people. It was his view that giving a man a fish will feed him for a day, but teaching a man to fish will feed him for a lifetime. That's why he said that the correct reaction to the spread of scarlet fever was not to fund another hospital ward, but to finance scientific research into cures, medicines, and vaccines. Nowadays, every rich guy worth his Bitcoin sets up charities in his name, but Rockefeller was the trendsetter. That's why he created the General Education Board with other magnates. Today, the organization funded support for higher education regardless of race, sex, or creed. It focused on black and white children in the rural South, and its modernization of medical schools and farming practices helped eradicate hookworm. John D. Rockefeller supported orphanages. He personally paid for a slave's freedom and donated to abolitionist causes. With his wife, he supported women's suffrage movements. At the time, some of these causes caused a stir, but he saw humanitarianism as a duty. He created what is now named the University of Chicago. He helped the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York expand its collection. Plus, his family donated the land on which the United Nations were built. By the end of his life, he had personally donated $874 million. He was Ned Flanders on the streets, but Mr. Burns in the balance sheets. Of course, none of this would have been possible if he hadn't figured out how to become a leader of an industry. Rule 4. Learn how to outsmart your competitors. When it came time to leave his bookkeeping job, John and a partner borrowed money from his crooked father at high interest rates to set up their commodity venture. By now, he'd learned about managing risk and reward, so it was no surprise that the 18-year-old's first year as his own boss saw him rake in $450,000. But he knew this wasn't his ceiling. He kept his ear to the ground for the next big business opportunity over the horizon, which in the end was oil. This was still at a time when dead dinosaur liquid had yet to become the powerhouse commodity that it is today. So moving to this new industry was as risky as selling refrigerators to Eskimos, and John recognized this. Upon seeing the mountains of Cleveland having their forests cut down to make way for drills, he realized he needed to innovate to avoid getting crushed by competition, so he pivoted to refineries. Now, all those companies that were pumping black gold from the hills would need to come to him so they could refine it before selling it on. That's why he picked a spot near the biggest train station in Pittsburgh, thereby ensuring he would encounter all oil being transported through the region. As they say in business, location, location, location. But this bold move was just the start. In order to have the biggest refinery by the age of 25, John borrowed millions of modern dollars worth from banks. Whereas most people would avoid risking so much debt, he saw that his prime position would not last long if he didn't grow enough to keep new rivals at bay. Unfortunately, he was unable to scale the business and was on the verge of bankruptcy. So what he did next is the thing people criticize him for the most. At the age of 27, he formed a conspiracy with the train companies. The idea was simple, if perhaps illegal. Give the train baron 60 barrels of oil a day in exchange for raising the transport prices of his rivals. Soon enough, independent oil drillers were losing money. To add insult to injury, Rockefeller used his train connections to use up all the carriages, buy up all the barrels, and hoard all the chemicals needed for refining. By tightening his grip on their resources, he was able to undercut his rivals without being in direct competition. This made it easier to buy them out. Though John would work to get their cooperation, he wasn't, as he said, afraid to make them sweat. No doubt his father's tricks were vital in slowly sucking up each company into his new holding business, Standard Oil. The corporation was only active for three years before the Great Depression hit, but it was strong enough to take advantage by buying up the remaining competitors at knockdown prices. Soon, he controlled 98% market share for a modern equivalent of $225 billion. By the time the government intervened by passing anti-monopoly acts, Rockefeller had already amassed roughly $660 billion in today's money. This 40 chess mindset changed history, but he was determined to not let the money change him. Rule 5. Remember what it's like to be broke. The old saying goes that you get rich by living poor, and you get poor by living rich. Almost 70% of lottery winners are likely to declare bankruptcy within 3-5 to five years of receiving their prize. And what's the first thing people do when they get a big promotion? Buy a new car, on a loan of course. 
Everyone has a friend who is terrible with money, and if you don't, it's you. But Rockefeller was adamant to not let his fortune get to his head. In fact, he viewed it as more of a burden. When it came time to find a place for his wife, child, and future children, he went to the millionaire's row of Cleveland, Euclid Avenue. He could afford any of the sprawling manors on offer, but instead chose the most basic, humble house there was. No doubt it was impressive for any average person, yet he made sure the inside was below average. He was convinced that riches led to sin, so he stripped the interior of all luxuries. Children wore hand-me-down clothes, they shared toys, and earned allowances. They didn't even play with the neighbors that often let them see what they were missing. This determination to build virtuous character was so strong that the children's mother once proudly confided to a neighbor that she was happy to know what her children wanted for Christmas so that she could deny them the gift. When John's son John Jr. was older, he said that in their childhood home, money was like air. It was all around, but never easily attained. The children's upbringing of restraint and frugality reflected the early years of John and his wife, Laura. It was the perfect training to replicate the Rockefeller's mindset when the children eventually took over the company upon John's death at 97 years young, in 1937. But in all this, John D. Rockefeller relished time with his children. He would play with them, take them for bike rides, and show them daring feats. Despite the house rules on money, the children said he never told them what not to do. His love for them was not in gifts and materialism, but in memories and adventure. So it seemed like he gave them the father that he never had. No doubt because John D. Rockefeller recognized that a happy childhood is priceless. So what's your verdict? Did his charity absolve his capitalistic sins? Let us know in the comments. Now, the Rockefellers aren't the only family to basically not give their children any money and tell them to just go earn it themselves. If you like this video, be sure to check out our one on the Mars family. And be sure to like and subscribe to keep on learning how history works.